Monet, can you do me a favor? What? Can you set a timer? And uh, let's see. Oh, never mind. Wow, there are. Okay, let's go right here. I was gonna have my wife set a timer for how long it would take us to find a parking spot at the Park Meadows Mall, but we found one fast. Just uh, picking up a few essentials from Starbucks. I really dislike coming to the mall during this time of year because of all the people and traffic. It just stresses me out. But it's also fun just to hang out with the family and do some shopping. Welcome to day 25 of the J137 vlog, going through the Bible in a year chronologically. And Papa's coming over to get them all. Duly noted. And today we are looking at Genesis 41 and 42. Genesis 41, we open up with God giving Pharaoh two dreams. Dream number one. He, Pharaoh dreams that uh, he's, he's like on the bank of the Nile and out of the Nile come seven like healthy fat cows and then come out of the Nile seven real skinny and un look like cows that look unhealthy and the unhealthy cows actually eat the healthy cows but they're still skinny they're, they didn't grow or get fat or anything. Dream number two. In the second dream we see that there's these stalks of grain and there's seven um, bulbs or, or type of you know grain on this stock and the first seven they're plump they're good they're full but then there's another seven that pop up that are skinny and and not plump and those heads of grains or those grains eat the plump ones and then what happens they uh, they those grain that ate the grain the skinny grain that ate the fat grain stays the same then Pharaoh has all of his wise people come before him to try to interpret these two dreams, but they're not able to. And then the cupbearer, he remembers Joseph in prison and says, hey, there's this Hebrew in prison who he interpreted these dreams for us. Maybe he can interpret your dream. And that's exactly what Joseph does. He interprets these dreams and tells Pharaoh that the, these two dreams mean the same thing, that there will be seven years of plenty in the land of Egypt. And then after those seven years of plenty, there's going to be seven years a famine. And Joseph basically tells Pharaoh, you need to establish officials throughout the land who will um, take a certain amount of the food from the years of plenty to be stored so that in the famine we are able to survive. And Pharaoh, he responds by essentially putting Joseph, who is in prison at this point, second in command in the entire land of Egypt. The only one that is above him is Pharaoh himself. Because this famine is so severe, it is affecting Jacob and all of his sons back where they are at. And so Jacob sends his sons, except for Benjamin, to go to Egypt to buy some of this grain so that they can survive in the famine. And when they come to the area where they're getting ready to buy grain, Joseph is there, he's selling it to people he recognizes his brothers and scripture tells us that he deals with them roughly, uh, almost ruthlessly in a way as if to, you know, 
kind of pay them back. It's approximate, it's about maybe 10 years from the time in which Joseph was sold into slavery to this point when they reunite. In his rough dealing with his brothers, he accuses them of being spies, but to prove that they aren't spies, and he knows that they're not, um, he wants them to go back and bring their youngest brother, Benjamin, to essentially prove that you know, they're, they're not spies. So what happens is Joseph holds Simeon captive or confines him and then sends the rest of the brothers back to get Benjamin. But as he sends them back, he's putting uh, lots of grain in their sacks as well as giving them money too. And this actually frightened his brothers when they found that they had all this money because they thought that Joseph thought that they were stealing and that was going to put them in even a worse situation with this who they thought this was an official. They didn't realize it was Joseph yet. It's interesting that here the brothers thought that God was repaying them for the evil that they had done to Joseph. The reason why this Egyptian official was treating them this way and that they potentially would lose Simeon and... What? You're done? Yeah. Go, you're done doing what? I gotta go help my kid fi finish being done going poo-poo. Okay, uh, we then see that Joseph retreats into private to, to weep. They leave and head back home, and they tell their father Jacob all that transpired. And Jacob, he doesn't want Benjamin to go because he's afraid that he's going to lose Benjamin. He already lost Joseph, and that he's going to lose Simeon now because Simeon is held confined back in Egypt. Like, it, it, And the chapter just wraps up with... Jacob being just an anguish. In these two chapters, well, really chapter 41, this is what really stuck out to me in today's reading. I find it so interesting that Pharaoh acknowledged God to a certain degree. It, you know, in Egyptian culture, they had many gods. Um, you know, they had their primary god that they worshipped, but, but even Pharaoh himself was considered a deity. For Pharaoh to recognize this one true living God, that the Spirit of God is, is with Joseph. We see that in chapter 41, verse, verse 38. It, it's a big deal. Scripture talks about this a lot, but how God, he is over the nations. And at this time, historically speaking, Egypt is most likely the most powerful nation on the planet. And yet there's this acknowledgement that God is greater than us. I'll just say this, I'm not going to elaborate, but I'll just say this, and I'll, you can maybe elaborate more in your own mind, but this is why we trust in God and not systems of government. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is the success that God gave to Joseph. Joseph went through a lot of difficulty and a lot of trouble, but you see where the Lord brought him second in command in arguably the most powerful nation on planet Earth at that time. And it would be easy to, and tempting, to look at Joseph's life and try to pull some points out that we can apply to our life that would hopefully lead to similar success or at least more success than maybe what we have currently in our life. Whether it's a career that you're in or being a parent or a student, whatever it may, whatever it may be. But there is this craving that we all have within us to be successful. What I love about Joseph here is that he is not acknowledged he, he is not saying that the success is he is not saying that the success is predicated on him, but it's the Lord. The Lord gave him the success. And while there are things that we can do, things that we can walk in to try to gain more success in our life, the fact of the matter is God will allow us to be as successful as he wants us to be. The, the things that are constant here. And I, th I think if we can pull anything from Joseph in terms of things we can walk in, there's really two things I see. The first thing is humility. We see that in his acknowledgement that God is doing this stuff. And the second thing is, is have integrity. We see that when we go back to him being a servant in Potiphar's house and all the responsibilities he was given and even how he ran from Potiphar's wife that he was a man that had integrity, that he did what was right, even when no one was around. So, humility and integrity. 
while we have this desire within us to be successful, the danger is when we make attaining success our idol or our God. Instead of seeing success and attaining it and growing in it as a way to worship God, to make a big deal out of God, and to show the world how wonderful God is. Don't make success your God. Goodness. That trash can was nasty full. I mean, come on people, can't we, can't we put our trash somewhere else so it doesn't I mean, we have to make that trash can work so hard. Poor little trash can. <laughs>